at the right time because I think this is going to really help you elevate your nonprofit's online presence. Today, we're going to be talking about a guide to effective SEO strategy. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here at TechSoup. We have Julian Grace and John Hill from TAP Network. They're going to be your experts today, but I'm going to show you how you can engage on the next slide. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, you already on, know you're on mute. What I'd love for you to do is put your questions in the Q&A. And I know a lot of you have seen everybody put their websites in the chat. Continue doing that. Let, you, let us know where you're from. Check your email. We're going to email you the slides and the video replay by tomorrow. If you need the closed caption, you can look at the bottom of your screen and see where it says CC. And that'll allow you to turn on the closed captions. I'm excited to be here. I know you're excited to be here. I'm already studying your websites. I'm going to go off camera so Julian and John can take over for now. And you guys have a great webinar. And thank you for being here. Thanks, Aretha. Um, my name is Julian. Uh, uh, like Aretha said, I'm from TAP Network. Uh, I work a lot with fixing websites, looking at SEO, you know, coming up with a lot of creative solutions to problems. So I'm excited to get into some of the information today. Um, and, and hopefully we get a lot of really uh, helpful and interesting and engaging questions. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, John. Yep, I'm John. I am a web project manager here at TAP. I work with all the different teams here, uh, from the designers to the devs to the account managers. I kind of work with each project flow all the way through from beginning to end to make sure it happens with ease. So uh, I'll start with a little bit about us. Who is TAP Network? We are a full service digital marketing agency that has partnered with TechSoup for over eight years. Uh, over these years, we've provided vast amounts of marketing, thought leadership, and expertise, <clears throat> not only to uh, TechSoup, but thousands of their members. So we're, we really appreciate you guys joining us today and hope to provide you guys with some uh, actionable insight into SEO. Um, so let's get started. Start with our agenda. Uh, here's just kind of a quick overview. We're going to start with, you know, what is SEO? Start at the basics how SEO gains new users, kind of the practical applications, um, our services that we provide as well. And then we are leaving some time at the end for a little bit of Q&A. So if you want to start thinking of some questions um, for that. So let's break it down, starting with the basics. What is SEO? Uh, we're going to start this off with a little bit of a poll question. How familiar are you with SEO, search engine optimization? Uh, a, very, B, somewhat familiar, C, heard of it, don't know much at all, or D, not familiar at all. So if you're in the chat, you want to respond? Seen a lot of Bs, some As. Bs, Cs, As. All right. Looks like everyone, everyone's heard of it, at least. Everyone kind of knows what it is. Well, so some of this might be review for you guys. Some of this might be brand new. So uh, hopefully we can uh, teach you guys some new stuff. So the basics, let's say, you know, you have a fantastic website, but it's like a hidden gem, you know, people who are looking for you can't find it. This is kind of where SEO comes in. SEO is kind of the behind the scenes magic for your website. So it helps search engines understand what your site is about. So so they can show it to the right people, right? And these right people are folks searching for what you offer, like you know, volunteer opportunities, ways to donate, et cetera. Um, important note, always like to note this, especially at the beginning, uh, SEO isn't one big trick. It's more like a toolbox. It's a set of practices, not one singular thing. Um, you, know, you use the different tools to make your website easy to navigate. You write uh, clear and engaging content. Um, you know, keeps things running smoothly all behind the scenes. So by making your website more discoverable with SEO, you're going to get more people to see your cause. Um, that means, you know, increased awareness, helping more people and ultimately a bigger impact. It's a win-win for all, right? Uh, so up next, Julian is going to go over some of the rules of SEO. Yeah, definitely. So often, you know, when I first start working with somebody on, on search engine optimization, they're often looking for, you know, uh, the one thing they can do to shoot them to the top of results. Um, that doesn't really exist. Here. So um, one of the first things I like to say is that it is a zero sum game and only the search engine knows the score. That means that there's a, a ranking. Somebody's going to be at the top. Somebody's going to be on the top of page two. 
and, and on and on. And the way that uh, all those are organized, we know a good amount of information about, but we don't know everything. So Google keeps a lot of the stuff, um, you know, uh, in development sort of uh, behind closed doors. They release some information every now and then, usually after they make a change. Um, there's not a way to cheat this system. Sort of any any way you think that you can uh, come up with like a, a special trick to, you know, out outpace some people, um, you see they're going to be, your website's going to be de-indexed or it's just not going to have an effect and you're going to end up going to end up spinning your wheels. Um, so there's not just one thing you can do to sort of like trick around or like an extra hack or anything like that. Uh, the quality and quantity of your content matters. So it's not just enough to say, hey, I'm going to get a lot of content with this keyword in there. Um, you really need to pay attention to the value of that content. Make sure it's serving users in some way. Um, and then finally, that success uh, is limited. So one, that there's usually only so much you can do um, you know, on a, a singular page. Um, you know, once it's fully optimized, there's not much to go on but try and do other things across your site. Then also in time, things change, new websites appear, old websites disappear, rankings change, algorithms change. So this is really, these set of practices should set you up for success no matter what comes along, whether you're gonna be adding a bunch of content, whether you're putting together a new website or, or things change with the Google search, these should be really helpful for you. Um, and uh, next I wanna talk a little bit about the algorithm. So um, some notes on this, the algorithm, you know, now that there's so many social media platforms you are a little bit more familiar with the concept of the algorithm. This is just Google's search algorithm here. But some notes here, Google isn't just a basic indexer. It may have started that way, um, but right now, it's a company that provides a service to users, and that service is knowledge. They're not necessarily trying to um, uh, uh, give you a, a complete list of all the websites that have the word email in it, for example. Think of all the ones where it just has the contact field, it has the word email in there. Somebody's just typing in the word email. They're not really looking for a list of websites that has that word on there, and they want the one that has it listed the most. They're trying to interpret that search and provide you an answer here. It also implements new features all the time. So they make thousands of changes a year. Some we know about, uh, some we can only sort of notice that there was a change um, and we, we're not quite sure what the details of it are. Some are completely transparent to us. Um, and the internet is a large place. Um, there's information um, all over the place. New, it's so easy to set up a new website. So uh, Google really has a challenge in trying to figure out, hey, when somebody searches this term, what order do we list all these things? We have two ads and 10 results to display on this first page of results. We know people aren't gonna get very uh, far past that. How are we really going to get these people what they want? Another thing is with all these changes, how do we address it? How do we adapt to all these changes that come in here? So there's, here's three questions I like to sort of ask before I, I really spend some time on something. First, is it gonna affect me? Is this a change that, you know, if it's dealing with uh, parsing low quality content or AI generated content, if you don't have any of that on your site, you have nothing to worry about. Otherwise, can you measure its impact? If you have, you know, if you see a change that's coming in, um, do you have the tool set up to understand what it's going to do to your traffic, how it's going to affect your user behavior? And finally, is it busy work? Is it going to be something that's so small that you, you would be able to change something, but it involves so much work that it's really the juice isn't worth the squeeze? Um, there are some things that you might see a change in here. It's usually going to be fixed with sort of your regular website updates. Um, so really pay attention to that. You're not going to need to jump on every little change that is made, but it's important to know the broad strokes of them as they come along. Finally, uh, knowledge is cheap and tools are valuable. So with so much information being widely available, um, just having information be the, the one thing that you provide, it's not going to work out for you uh, very long. Uh, information can be found in, in multitudes of places. What users really want and need and what Google tries to prioritize are tools for them to complete actions. The end goal of all this isn't to have a website. The end goal is to have other people use that website and engage with your organization to further your mission. So turning that website into a tool that can help users accomplish something is going to be much more beneficial for you than just trying to display information. I think we missed one right here, John. Let's go back. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yep. Sorry about that. All right. Yeah, I'll take it over from here. Uh, so we'll kind of unpack some of the handy terms that we've got when it comes to SEO, kind of the things you're going to hear a lot when it comes to SEO. Uh, first up, we've got 
organic and paid. Uh, organic are the results that are kind of the free listings you see on the search engines, the ones you've earned through your SEO work. Um, these are what show up when you kind of just do a search naturally, let's say on Google. And the paid results are the, uh, you know, the paid ads where you pay to appear at the top. Uh, much more depth to it, but that's kind of an overview of the entire thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go into keywords a little bit. These are the words or phrases people will type into the search engines. Uh, you want your website to be a good match for those relevant keywords. So people are searching for help related to those things that then they can find you easily. Um, another thing always to keep in mind is your competitors. Um, by understanding you know, their SEO strategies, what keywords they seem to be using, you can um, find ways to make your website stand out among them. Another important term is backlinks. So imagine these kind of as like online votes of confidence, if you will. Um, when other websites link to yours, it tells the search engines that your site is valuable. So the more high quality backlinks you have, the better. Also, of course, sharing your content on social media uh, can drive traffic back to your website, which uh, search engines can take note of is important. Uh, readability is key. Uh, we want your website content to be clear and easy to understand. Uh, you know, if a visitor gets lost in all the jargon, they'll probably bounce off of it. Uh, you want to think of your audience and write for them. Um, and then you can, you can see uh, on the image here, have you ever seen these fancy summaries that kind of pop up next to search results? These are called search engines result page features or snippets. These are used to like, you know, grab attention, get people interested to click on your website and using things like structured data. Uh, think of it kind of as labeling your content for search engines uh, can help you land those coveted snippets. Uh, it's kind of like giving Google a cheat sheet to understand your work, if you will. Um, again, something to always remember is that SEO um, is always kind of a bit of an experiment. So Google does offer, offer like free tools and stuff to use, um, like this uh, link here, which is the rich results test, where you can preview how your content might appear in a snippet, um, which is a great way to see how your F SEO efforts are all paying off. Um, again, you'll get the slides afterwards, so you will be able to access all these links and stuff in here. Um, yeah, from there, I'll hand it back over to Julian. Yeah, so some other things that you uh, want to take a look at, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the metas. Um, so the first is the meta title. So as you can see here, this is what TechSoup's meta title and meta description looks like. That's that big blue link. So the words that you put in your meta title um, are going to have an effect on your rank. You know, um, if you if you want to rank for a word, having that be in your page title, which is often the, the meta title for that page, um, you know, that's going to have a, a much bigger effect for you. You're not going to want to leave these, um, you know, a, a very generic. Um, so you don't just want to have um, home and that's it. Maybe you, you know, append your organization's name or you really start to uh, get the keywords in here that that are going to give you, you know, a, a valuable uh, a keyword placement. So you want to take advantage of, of that heavy rank effect. On the other hand, the meta description does not have any effect on your rank, but it is very important for the users who are using your site. So they're going to be searching these general terms, and they're going to be presented with a list of, of 12 results, two ads, um, uh, uh, 10 organic results, and they need to choose one. And the main differentiator for all those is going to be that context that's applied under each one of those meta titles. So make sure that you, uh, you pay attention to that and write them. Um, Google might not uh, always choose the ones you write. You may sort of grab content uh, from the other uh, uh, from the uh, from the page itself. Um, but you really want to make sure that it's, it's giving the user an insight into what they're going to find there, what they can accomplish on the page. So it's very action oriented and human targeted. And finally, meta keywords. So uh, some SEO tools are going to have this still in their suites, um, but Google has stopped using them as. Uh, uh, anything to do with, with ranking, or they've basically taken it completely out of the question. Um, and I do see a couple things coming in here, so I wanna answer some questions right now. Where do we actually write our meta title and meta description? That's really gonna depend on your website platform. Um, so, you know, on WordPress, you might be able to do that on the page level uh, with a tool like Yoast. On Wix, there's a dedicated SEO section. Each platform is gonna be a little bit different, but you're gonna write it on a, a page and post level. 
And then uh, the other uh, question I see here from Susan is uh, need to be careful not to bloat your website with keywords. Thoughts about that? We're going to talk a little bit about that as we go along, but you definitely don't want to be bloating it. That sort of falls into that. There's, there's, uh, you know, no cheat codes or anything to this. You can't just type a, a single keyword a bunch of times um, and expect to rank up for it or put in a bunch of keywords that don't make sense with the content. Um, they have ways to sort of detect a lot of those things. Um, and we'll, we'll give some, some alternative ways to implement keywords as we go along. Finally, there's something called a robots.txt file. It's basically search instructions for Google's indexer. So you can say, hey, I want this page not to be indexed at all. Um, or I want to sort of tag my links with certain pieces of information. That's where you're able to sort of control how your site is being crawled and indexed and can do a lot of things uh, right from there. So next, I'm going to pass it off to John to talk about how this gains us new users. Sure. Well, we've got a little poll question for you guys up first. So what is your main goal for improving your organization's online presence? A, increase website traffic. B, online donation. C, raise awareness for your mission. D, improve engagement with your audience. There might be a multiple choice. You might be able to uh, select all also. Seen A, B, C, seen all of them so far. And a lot of all of the above, which makes sense. Yep. A lot of C's also, which is uh, raising awareness about your mission. Yep. Okay, all right. Well, now we're going to talk about kind of the three main types of SEO. We've got on-page, off-page, and technical SEO. Think of them as working together, all together, to raise that SEO score. So mainly at the moment, we're going to focus on on-page and off-page overall. Um, on-page SEO focuses on optimizing the content and structure of your website itself. So things like keywords, which Julian did just talk about a bit, um, you know, you don't want to bloat your website with them, but you do want to have enough relevant keywords on your website that uh, people can use to then find you. So you kind of want to sprinkle those out throughout your website naturally. Content is key. So, uh, you know, creating high quality content that showcases your mission um, and the impact you make. So things like blogs, infographics, stories, these are all great ways to engage your audience. Um, also, again, things like meta descriptions and titles. So think of these kind of like as mini ads for your website on the search engine result pages. Um, so you want to make sure you craft something that is clear and concise that makes people want to click on them. Um, another thing is, of course, videos and images. People love visuals, right? Um, and then making sure those are optimized. So optimizing your images with relevant keywords and alt text is also super important. Um, other things like off page, which focuses on building your website's reputation and authority outside of your own domain. Um, so things like link building, like backlinks we talked about earlier. It's good to encourage other high quality websites to link back to yours. You know, this shows search engines that your site is credible and valuable. Social media is of course, super important these days. I think we all know that. Um, another thing that you might want to do or consider is guest blogging, uh, contribute guest posts to, um, other websites within your field or your niche. Um, this is a great way to expand, uh, your reach and also kind of work on building those backlinks between other websites. If you can collaborate with other people, um, online reviews is also always a good thing to encourage, uh, you know, satisfied supporters, um, to leave positive reviews on platforms like Google or Yelp. Um, you know, this builds trust and credibility. And then technical SEO focuses on kind of the behind the scenes workings of your websites, making sure it's healthy and easy for the search engines to understand. Um, so things like structured data, um, imagine adding labels to your website content like donation page or volunteer opportunity. Uh, it helps search engines understand the specific meaning of your content, which can lead to richer search results with features like the snippets we talked about earlier. Um, Another thing is the XML sitemaps. Um, a sitemap is kind of like a map of your website listing all the important pages. Uh, search engines should crawl and index. Um, like I said before, 
all three of these work together to kind of create that strong foundation for your website search engine success. So it's important to work through all of them to an extent. Um, Julian is going to kind of dive deeper into some of these, so I'll go hand it back over to him. Yeah, so the first thing we're going to dig into is a little bit of this on-page SEO. So the first thing I want to highlight is the user experience for the people who are going to be on your site. Um, so one of the things that you really want to avoid is people going onto the site, not really doing anything, hitting their back button and going to another result. So you want to make sure, you know, in line with that, think of your website as a tool for users to accomplish something. You want to make sure that it's set up for them to understand what they can accomplish. How do they get there? You know, people are going to be coming in with different reasons. Some people might need your help. Some people are looking to volunteer. Other people are looking to support you with donations. Making it clear where they can go to accomplish those actions on your site is going to be very, very important. It's also going to help you out a lot. So it's not just say, hey, we're doing this to do better on Google. You're doing this to better serve the people you're trying to reach and, you know, better engage with uh, the people around you. Um, you also want to pay attention to the actual content on your site. So when you're thinking about those ideal users, those volunteers, those donators, those people who are going to participate in your programs, you really want to think about what they know and sort of the language they use, not just your own. You know, there may be uh, uh, some people um, who, who might not have the technical knowledge to understand how you might normally talk about some of the important work you do. So making sure that you can sort of educate them as they come in so they have that knowledge and then better understand exactly how your organization fits in to help them or anything like that. You really want to pay attention to um, the audiences you're trying to communicate. You don't just want to display the information uh, that you might talk about when you're writing grants or working with other organizations. You want to think about the people on the other side of the screen. And with that, you really want to pay attention to accessibility. So HTML, which is the language that builds up a lot of these websites, does have a little bit of a built-in structure. So you can have these heading tags to organize your information. When people, you know, first interact with uh, a website, they don't really read every single word as they go down. They're skimming through it. Um, you know, people who are looking to volunteer aren't going to need the information about donating or, or participating in one of the programs. So they're going to be looking for that volunteer uh, information. And having properly uh, uh, structured heading tags allows that to be parsed a little bit easier for regular users, but then also people who use screen readers. That really helps with the ability to sort of parse through a lot of that information and you know, having one H1 tag with some you know, important keywords for the page on it, that's going to help your rank. And then structuring the rest of them with you know, two H2s, a couple H3s, stuff like that. It's going to just um, make making pages a, a lot easier. You're going to have those designs already built. It's going to organize your information. And it's going to make it a lot easier to skim through and, and for people to parse the information. That's important to them. And I am going to touch very briefly on off-page SEO. So this is one thing that we're not going to go too deep into. I think there's a little bit more helpful information for the on-page and technical side of things. Um, but building real-world connections is, is part of it. So um, uncovering opportunities to uh, you know, be linked on, on other websites through those backlinks, that's not really something you can just decide for somebody. You're going to need to interact with other organizations and say, hey, you know, we're doing this. Uh, uh, would you mind listing us on your resource page? Or interacting with... Uh, the community uh, organizations that are, are local to you, any sort of uh, neighborhood boards or things like that, having that is all going to drive traffic onto your website. And then it's not just, um, it, you know, uh, uh, websites and face-to-face and -face stuff. Um, you can do things like social media, sending out your email newsletter, putting up flyers with QR codes. All these can drive the website traffic. It's going to help sort of build that reputation that you have as you know, uh, a, a organization that can do good and a website that's going to help accomplish all of that. And, you know, the simplest way to do that is just making the tangible change for your mission. So doing the things that you, you know, uh, you are meant to do that you say you're going to do in your mission and sharing uh, the results and, and how other people can accomplish the same things. That's really going to help with the SEO. Um, it's not just a game where you're trying to impress Google. You're really trying to get out there in the real world uh, with, with people on the other side of the screen. And that's where this sort of comes from. The site should serve your user first and Google second. So while all the things we talk about are geared towards you know, best practices for the search engine, they are also best practices for dealing with you know, the people who are going to be visiting your site. So let's talk a little bit about how the, the content serves users and the searchability. And in order to do that, we're going to need to talk a little bit about the technical stuff here. 
So one thing that you should really pay attention to is site speed, especially as you know, there are new website tools, more people can make websites. Uh, you might not have the knowledge of the best practices for, for how to sort of optimize a lot of the technical side of things. So one of the biggest offenders for slow site speeds is images. Text is very, very small. Images can be very, very large. You take you know, something just on your iPhone and you post it as is on the website, you might be looking at three megabytes for a single photo. Maybe, especially if it's gonna be used very small, you don't need all that information there. So um, uh, if it's over one megabyte, take a look at it. Um, you know, you, you're usually gonna wanna have it, you know, much lower, right around like 400 kilobytes, but one megabyte is the, the danger zone. If you have a lot of them, it's really gonna slow things down. Um, I did list some tools here that I like. Um, it's often helpful to optimize these images before you upload them to your website. So the desktop tool I like is Image Optum. It's free, I've used it for uh, about a decade now. There's uh, Pinga here. There's things for your browser like Tiny PNG and Optimizilla. And then say you have a bunch of images that aren't optimized, but you need to uh, you need to find a way to bring down the size. There's the EWW image optimizer and SiteGround Speed. Now there's a way to test your page speed instead of just you know loading your browser and with a stopwatch. There are other things and more helpful information you can get. So this is a screenshot of one of Google's websites. Um, so this is their Google Trends website, which allows you to sort of track um, you know the popularity of searches over time. And you can see that even a Google website isn't going to score 100 on these. So keep that you know in mind as you're looking at some of your results. Um, you know, a, a plain HTML page with a single you know word on it and no photos or anything might score 100. Um, but anything is just going to give you uh, opportunities for improvement here. So it's going to give you things like, hey, how long does it take for uh, something to appear? That first contentful paint. How long does it take for the last thing to appear? Um, you know, 8.6 seconds for everything to be fully loaded. Yeah, it's pretty slow. Maybe we need to look into what's exactly causing that. It will give you details further down the report on this Google page uh, speed test. Um, and it'll sort of say, hey, take this image. This is really loading here. Or here's a way to rebuild some of the optimization stuff. This is going to help you out. And you know, to further help the speed, you're going to want to use a site cache. So on the next slide here, I have a very rough illustration of what a site cache is. So unless you're using a static site, which if you were, you would definitely know this, um, a website page is being built when somebody sort of requests that URL. So here you can see on the left-hand side, uh, this yellow dot is a user. It's telling its computer, hey, I want to view this website. And then the computer goes to uh, the website server and it's saying, hey, do we have a version of this page ready in the cache? And then it says, nope, let's go. And it talks to the PHP, it grabs the information from the database, builds all that out, and then serves it there. So if you implement a page cache, you can see you can take out the, the build phase of a lot of this. So you can just store a pre-built version of that page so it can be delivered um, a lot faster here. It's going to help, especially if you're serving up images um, or, or you know frequently searched items. Having that page cache is going to speed things up quite a bit. It's really going to depend on what website platform you're on um, the, you know, to, to determine which one's going to be the best one. Um, but really take a look and you're going to want to implement at least some kind of it here. There's also going to be caches, you know, the ISP might cache certain websites. People are going to have a uh, version of their websites cached in their own local browsers. And just like a little bonus website troubleshooting tip, most of the time, I shouldn't say most of the time, a good amount of the time when we see issues with websites here, um, uh, a simple cache purge is going to help with a lot of that. It's just saying, hey, get rid of the stored version. There's something wrong with it build me a new fresh one, get, get all the new content in here. And so oftentimes that'll happen automatically, but sometimes things can get caught. It's going to be really helpful uh, for you to just have that and, and understand that tool. Next, uh, John's going to talk a little bit about sitemaps. Yeah. Um, so kind of briefly touched on sitemaps a little bit ago, but you know, think of a sitemap kind of as a blueprint for your website, showing search engines uh, like exactly what pages you have and how they're connected. You know, having a sitemap helps search engines discover all of your content, like blog posts, donation pages, volunteer opportunities, et cetera. Uh, this ensures nothing gets lost in the uh, search engine shuffle, if you will. Uh, the good news 
is that you don't have to create a sitemap by hand. Most platforms offer tools or plugins to help. For instance, on WordPress, you can use Yoast SEO or uh, Google Sitemap Generator to create and submit your sitemaps of your own. There's a handy resource on this slide here that kind of dives deeper into sitemaps. Again, you'll be getting the slides after this. Um, so you'll be able to check those out. A well-structured um, sitemap kind of really does go a long way in helping search engines understand your website as a whole. So on the next slide, Julian, we'll kind of wrap up some of the technical SEO stuff. Yeah, and just to sort of reiterate some of the stuff we talked about before, that structured data here, the feature snippets and the provided answers are really um, uh, the future of Google search. So sometimes it's going to provide an answer and cite people. Other times it's going to try and provide an AI answer. So this one is very much still in development. Uh, you may have seen uh, the example I always like to use when I'm talking to folks is somebody typed in, how do I keep the cheese from falling off my pizza? And Google said, why don't you add Elmer's glue to it? Not something you really want to be eating. So there's still a, a lot of work to be done with that. But that sort of goes into uh, what I was saying at the very beginning, where um, you know, having a website that's just providing information isn't going to do a lot for you uh, moving forward. You really want to create a website that allows users to accomplish something. Um, and another thing that's probably going to be you know, coming down the pike is that there's not going to be a universal ranking. So it's not going to be like, this is the number one result for this term for everybody for all time. Um, you know, as Google tries to, you know, get more information, really understand what people are, are are searching for and saying and using, you know, the contextual information they have, it's things are going to show up um, in, in different orders for different folks. So you really want to make sure that you're applying these best practices and you have a website that's functioning as a tool and you're not necessarily just relying on a search result position. You have something that's actually, you know, working for you as an organization rather than a chore that you need to maintain to keep a particular spot. Um, and the last thing I just want to mention, um, a lot of platforms these days do this automatically, um, but make sure that your site is mobile uh, responsive. You know, uh, the image size is definitely uh, uh, much more impactful on the mobile side because people have, you know, uh, a little bit of weaker connections usually. But also your site is indexed and scored on the mobile version first. So when Google indexes your site, it's not pulling the desktop version, it's pulling the mobile version. So make sure you pay attention to it. Um, and uh, Izzy, you know, I, I hope I answered some of the, the questions with the, the AI overview tool. Um, we're really going to be talking about AI a little bit more as we go along, um, but, but definitely keep the questions, uh, questions coming. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the practical uh, applications. John? Yeah. So first, we've got another poll question coming in for you guys. So which of the following SEO practices have you tried or are interested in trying? A, creating content for your website, B, using social media to drive traffic, C, optimizing your website for search engines, or D, none of the above. I'm seeing some A, some B's, I'm seeing, I think E would be the option of all of the above, yep. Seeing a lot of A's and B's also. A lot of A's and B's, A, B's, and C's, a couple C's. All right, yeah. See Judy coming in with really C only. And so it looks like people are kind of all over with this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hopefully, you know, uh, some of these, uh, this practical implementation is going to give you the, the information to really uh, uh, take some steps today. So the first thing I want to recommend is, is installing Google Search Console and Google Analytics on your website. This is really the first step before you do anything else. This is going to allow you to monitor search engine performance, measure the changes as you make them, and also know when you've done enough, when there's you know the diminishing returns come and it's just you know the, the, uh, the time you're putting in, you're not getting that much back out of it. We're going to talk a little bit about you know, these tools as we go on. This really gives you that baseline to understand where the website is now. And then as you make these changes, you'll be able to measure against it so you can understand that impact. You know, if you don't have this set up here, you could be flying blind for a lot of things. You're not going to be able to see what people are searching for when they hit your website. You have to be able to understand how people move through your site. So it's really important, um, uh, day one, get this set up. Um, 
I'm seeing a couple questions here. Can you enable this on uh, Squarespace? You'll be able to enable this on any website. The way that you do so is going to look a little bit different for each website platform. You know, for example, WordPress has Google Site Kit, which is Google's own plugin that will allow you to, to turn things on. Um, other things like Squarespace and Wix will sort of just ask, you'll set it up on the individual websites for console analytics. And they'll give you a little measurement code. You put that in a box and it sets it up for you. So it's going to look a little bit different on every website, but it is available for every website. So I want to talk a little bit about Google Analytics. And so uh, some of the main stuff that you get with this is really understanding how people get to a site, what they're doing while they're on it. So you'll be able to see, hey, when somebody lands on a homepage, show me the breakdown of where they go next. You'll be able to see branching paths for how people are moving through it. Or you want to see, how are people getting to my event registration page? You can see, okay, these people came from a homepage call to action. These people came from a social media post. Uh, these people came uh, uh, from the events calendar page. That, that information, you'll be able to understand, hey, maybe there's an issue here. I'm not seeing people get to this page from the events calendar page. Is there something that I need to address here? It's also going to allow you to track events. So not just page views, but with enhanced measurement, you're going to get uh, be able to see stats on when people download files, if you're providing resources there, um, when they start a form, but maybe they don't submit it, you'll be able to see that. When they play a video, when they scroll, all these sort of events are going to be really helpful to understanding uh, what's going on on the website and what needs to be changed. Another thing I want to bring up are, are UTM tags. And this is something that can be implemented basically on, on any platform here. So what a UTM tag is, it's basically the information you'll see like after a question mark in a URL. You can pass along additional information to whatever that server is. So say you're putting up a QR code and on a printed flyer somewhere and it's linking to your website. People can scan that and then you'll be able to see, hey, this person came to the website. Um, and you know, they'll be marked as a direct link. But you really wanna see how just the people who were scanning the QR codes use the website. You don't wanna see everybody that landed on the homepage. You just wanna see those. You'll be able to add campaign names, you know, a, a media name, a whole bunch of fields that allows you to break down um, all the different links that you have out there and understand how just those users are interacting with the site. So say you have a social media post. Uh, you don't want just want to see the traffic that's come from Facebook in the past week. You want to be able to see, hey, how did this specific post do? By you know using UTM tags, it really allows you to get specificity um, for, for all of your sort of search campaigns and all the different ways that people are getting to the site. Tagging all those links can give a lot of helpful information to see what's working, what's not. Google does provide a really handy tool here. Um, there is a GA4 switch on there. Um, side note, uh, Google Analytics is deleting all the universal analytics data uh, next month. So make sure you download that and make sure you're on Google Analytics 4. Um, but this, you'll just be able to type in your link. And rather than just saying yourwebsite.org, you'll be able to say yourwebsite.org. And this is going to be the uh, summer, uh, summer resource event campaign. And it's going to be this flyer number one. And we're going to put this, this was put up by Julie. And later on in analytics, when somebody scans that QR code, you'll be able to see, oh, look, this person came in from this flyer. And you know, here's all the different other people who put up the flyers, you know, which locations work the best. You'll be able to get a lot of information like that, all free inside of Google Analytics. The next one I want to talk about is Google Search Console. And this might be sort of the most helpful one that you have in here. So you can see this, this graphic here shows you all the things that go into Google Search Console. So this is your direct connection to Google Search. This, again, is available for free as a Google product. All you need to do is confirm that you own the website. It'll do that in you know, a couple of different ways. You'll be able to choose depending on your platform. But it'll be able to check and validate everything we're talking about. So if you want to check your page speed, if you want to check if your site is be able to be indexed, if there's an issue with the robots.txt file, all these things will be available inside of Google Search. Say you have an old version of a page or you want to hide something from Google Search be able to do that. There's an issue of saying, hey, why aren't these pages showing up? Be able to submit your site maps. All that information is very, very helpful. So anytime you have an issue with Google Search, stop by Google Search Console and see if it's giving you any errors. It'll usually give you a path to resolution as well. One of the biggest things that you can do here is it shows you all of your backlinks. So your most popular ones, who's linking to you, what text is used to, be, uh, is used to link to you. So whether they're just putting your URL, whether they're linking your uh, organization name or something else. 
this can really give you um, a lot of helpful information right away regarding those backlinks. The next slide, I'm just this shows um, what you can expect to see when you're on uh, a Google Search Console. Now we did redact some data here, um, but you can see you can check your search results. You can understand, hey, when somebody searched X Y Z in uh, uh, the big blue box down here, which is covered up, be able to see, hey, how many clicks did you get from this versus how many times were you shown? Are there any discrepancies you need to investigate? Like say, hey, we're not getting that many clicks, but we're getting shown a lot. Is this, are we actually a bad match for this term? Do we need to sort of provide you know, a different meta description so people know what to expect when they're gonna click on it? Be able to, uh, like I said, submit your site maps, um, check about uh, any of your uh, feature results, just see general traffic coming from Google search is very, very helpful. Um, and a lot of the things that you're gonna pay for in other tools are mirrored here in Google Search Console. So while we here at Tap use paid tools, um, we still use Google Search Console all the time because it's that helpful. And it's also easy to share that information with other people. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about right here in this just sort of uh, day one section, getting things set up. You know, um, once you have these and you're putting together that baseline report, um, what do you actually put inside these reports? Um, so you wanna include the data from Analytics and Search Console. So you want to make sure that you're you're listing uh, the queries that you're showing up for, any sort of interesting things that are happening in your website traffic, or people are downloading a certain file a bunch. Um, you don't want to do these more frequent than monthly. So a lot of the changes you're going to make if you're trying to track, um, you know, uh, uh, keyword positions or or traffic from keywords, it's not going to change right away. So it's not going to be very sharp. You're really going to see sort of gradual increases and decreases. So on a monthly basis, I find that's a good mix between getting new information in there and then also being able to uh, be fairly responsive to things as they happen. Now, you can use external tools to do a lot of keyword track. That's mainly what they're, they're very beneficial for. Um, so these rankings do change um, day to day. Um, and some uh, keywords are a lot more difficult to rank for. If you're trying to rank for a hamburger, for example, think of all the burger places that are out there. Um, and, you know, if you're if you're going to try and rank very highly for that, you're going to have a lot harder of a road than if you're trying to rank for your organization's name, for example. And so um, our tool of choice here at TAP is SEMrush. Um, I've used it and I trust it. It's very helpful. And it can give you a lot of information. Um, uh, this is just a screenshot here of uh, the dashboard. So it doesn't give you all the information, but it shows you, you know, the, the internal linking of your pages, how well they're, they're set up together. Is there any crawl uh, issues between you and Google search? If there's any sort of major technical things you need to do. That's all in addition to the keyword tracking, which I find very helpful. And so now we're gonna jump into that keyword tracking. So I know I have a couple of questions in here uh, regarding keywords. Um, so, you know, um, uh, Bob here asks, what questions should you ask yourself as to what keywords to use? So it's really gonna depend on um, a lot of the uh, the things that you're trying to accomplish. So you want to think about it one in a way that uh, uh, you're able to provide helpful information on, but also in a way that that people are going to search for. So um, we're going to get to a little more specifics on that answer. But I want to start with that you're never going to rank for a keyword that isn't in live text on your site. So if you have like a big header image that your your design team created with the text baked into that image, that's not going to count towards having that keyword somewhere on your site. Um, I listed a couple more tools here, some applications, but I really want to highlight this, this types of language issue. So this sort of goes into what keywords you should actually try and use. If you want them to be action oriented and you want them to be helpful, you don't want to be too generic on these, but think about um, the way that, that you want to talk about things uh, first. So I had a client who uh, they did not use the word addiction on their website. They used substance use disorder. That sometimes can present a little bit of an issue because not everybody's going to search for substance use disorder. So uh, the way they they evaluated that uh, or resolved that was by saying, "Hey, we're going to educate people on why we don't use the word addiction in this in this uh, setting, and we're going to sort of provide substance use disorder as an alternative uh, definition. And that way, you sort of get the benefit of having both keywords on there while still staying true to your mission of of not really uh, identifying people as addicts or something like that." Um, you also want to pay attention to those, those actionable items that people are going to be searching for. So you may be an organization that provides community assistance, you know, helping them get housing or food or, or anything like that. But somebody, you know, might not be searching for community assistance. 
they might be searching for something a little more immediate to their situation, like I can't afford groceries or um, I'm being foreclosed on, something like that. Um, by including those uh, like can't afford groceries or something like that on your website, you're going to do better for those people who are searching for that immediate help. So that tends to be where, where sort of this strategy here is a little more beneficial. Those people who are going to uh, be looking for immediate uh, you know, assistance with their uh, uh, problems rather than sort of the, the broad strokes of what you do as an organization. But then also you may be talking to highly uh, technical uh, folks. So here, you know, TMDL pollution reduction goals isn't going to mean much to folks except for the ones that are already doing a lot of, of work in that field. So if you're trying to reach those people, use that specialized language. If you're trying to reach a, a more general audience, something like Chesapeake Bay water health is going to be a, a, a lot more helpful to try and rank for. So think of your audience and who you're, you're really trying to reach with this. Often it's a mix of a lot of different things. So it's not one or the other, but really pay attention to that. And as you do that, that should give you a, a good understanding of, of what keywords you should really be going for. There's other things that can go into that, you know, just based on your experience with the organization. But I find that's a helpful way to start. This is a, a sample keyword report that I have here that you can see. So it's going to give you things like how many people are searching for this uh, per month. So if there's a very low search volume, we often see this for an issue with people who are running Google ads to the Google ad grants. You know, there's just the terms they're going after don't have a lot of monthly search volume. There's not much you can do about it except to do the best you can and wait for sort of uh, uh, surges and, and the people that do come through. Also give you a little bit of a, a, a metric for how difficult this keyword is going to be to rank for. Um, it'll show you things um, like uh, the variations of the keyword that people search for, the question format that uh, people use. I just put in tech soup as a keyword here. And these are the things that start to appear. So we can see that, you know, it's fairly hard to rank for. They have a lot of stuff out there. Um, they do very well with their SEO. Um, but this just sort of gives you an understanding. So if you're saying, I'm going to try and rank for this keyword, what are you up against? What do people normally use this keyword for? Are they doing it to uh, navigate somewhere? Like if they search um, Chase Online Banking login, they want to go, they don't want to learn more about Chase Online Banking. They want to log into their, their bank account. Are they trying to find something out? Are they trying to buy something? All this information, you know, uh, that's where keyword reports really come in. You implement these keywords throughout your content. Uh, you don't just want to do this willy nilly, spend some time, understand what you're really going to focus around um, and combine that with tools in Google Search Console. And you can do uh, uh, a lot of really impactful work fairly easily. So um, just to wrap this up, ongoing SEO upkeep. Uh, the first thing I want to say is start with best practices. If you build these things with these best practices in mind, um, there's significantly less work to be done going forward. It's really um, uh, fixing the things that are already out there, optimizing those images, uh, seeing if your blog posts are focused around certain keywords. Um, if you can create it with this in mind, uh, you're going to uh, help prevent a lot of work for yourself in the future. Monitor relevant trends. And I really emphasize relevant here. Again, there's going to be uh, changes in search volume and algorithm things. Uh, make sure that you understand what's going to actually be helpful for you. Um, if there's something that you see that, hey, this is one of our core keywords, um, and you know people, there's a lot of interest on this, maybe you update a little bit of your calls to action on, on a page, or you create some new blog content to take advantage of that and you know um, really ride that wave of search traffic. Look for gaps in the user experience. So again, we're not trying to to win over Google, we're trying to do good by Google while also serving these users on the other side of the screen. So if you can see that people aren't doing anything on, on a certain web page and they're going back, see if you can change that web page. Are they are they getting to those forms that are important to you to sign up for programs or events? You know, see what's what's blocking for them. Um, that that user experience fix is really going to help your rank. Uh, Google's going to see that people are using the website more, and it's going to help those people more. And finally. Keep, keep your tech updated. So there's going to be updates forever. They're never going to go away. Um, so make sure that, you know, as, you know, maybe new WordPress versions or plugin updates come, or there's different versions of Wix that come in here, make sure that you're keeping things updated. Um, so you're not, you know, presenting security flaws or there's something wrong with your website that will then get you uh, deprioritized in Google search. And uh, I'm going to pass it back to John. All right.
Awesome. So and then we appreciate everyone coming out today. We are just going to quickly go over some of our SEO services. Um, then we're going to jump into a Q&A. I've already seen some questions coming out, which is awesome. Um, so up uh, first is our SEO audit. You know, we'll do a full analysis of your guys' website's current SEO, identify areas of improvements uh, for showing up better in search engines. As we said in the beginning, SEO is the result of a lot of small moving parts. So having a concise list of action is incredibly helpful. Um, you can see here the list of uh, some of the areas that the audit would contain. Many we've gone over already today. Um, also, we offer website maintenance services. So we'll take a lot of the guesswork out of things with your website and make, make it work even better. Um, you'll have a dedicated account manager that you can get a hold of during business hours um, and uh, the ability to submit tickets for edits or things that are broken with a 24 hour turnaround time. And then outside of SEO, we do almost everything, branding, logo, website development, CRM implementation, ongoing support and strategy. We're a full service uh, digital marketing agency specializing in services designed to help nonprofits grow. Um, so you can produce this on your own uh, this list over here at your own time later. Um, and you can learn more about us and our services that we've talked about uh, by visiting the TechSoup website and going to services and then website services. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, dive into a couple of the questions. So the first one I have here is from Jason who asks, do you have an opinion on specific SEO products like the Yoast plugin for WordPress? I love the Yoast plugin. The free version and the paid version are both very helpful. Um, you know, uh, on, on both versions, it'll walk you through a first time configuration, making sure that you have, you know, your, your brand image, all your titles configured, um, and walking you through um, just setting everything up properly. Um, but one of the biggest things that I really like it for is, especially if, if folks are coming to try and fix some of their current SEO, it has a bulk editor for the meta title and meta descriptions. So rather than going to your pages, um, selecting one, hitting edit, scrolling to the bottom, typing in the new meta description and the meta title, hitting save, going back to your pages and so on and so forth. Just being able to do that in a table view 10 at a time saves so much time. So um, I, I really do um, um, like the OS plugin. There's some other ones out there um, that I can't speak to as directly, um, but this a lot of these things aren't sort of propri proprietary. They're sort of open standards. And so open as far as Google goes and other other indexers. But um, um, Yoast definitely is is my uh, my recommendation for WordPress. Um, next, I have uh, one from uh, Don and then copied here uh, by Joni. Uh, so uh, she wants uh, both of our insights on this. How important is it to have only one domain? In our case, we have an internal controversy because some believe SEO is negatively affected when an organization uses more in one domain, and others don't think it matters. Example, is it okay for a single company to use both best hot dogs and pittsburgh.com and love pittsburghhotdogs.com? Uh, I'll be checking out both of those sites uh, later on, so I hope they're real. Um, but really, that depends on how these, these URLs are set up. Mm -hmm. So you're going to pay attention to which pay attention to which one is canonical. And so if you're trying to have you know two websites that have the exact same content but different URLs that's going to present an issue. Um, if you're just trying to say, hey, best hot dogs in Pittsburgh resolves to love Pittsburgh hot dogs, that's completely fine. You're going to set that stuff up in your in your uh, DNS and HT access files. Um, so it's definitely doable, um, but you don't necessarily, um, uh, it's not just saying, hey, we're going to copy the website with the new domain. That's not going to do any favors for you. Um, John, any other insight on that one? I mean, I have a similar answer to you in regards to this. Um, I don't think it's going to necessarily hurt you too much unless you are using pretty much a copy and paste for the same thing. I don't wouldn't recommend doing that, but if you're kind of linking these domains to the same site, I always think that that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Bob Peel here asks, if you're a code writer and using pre-built sites, can we still use these tools or what do you recommend? You can definitely use these, um, uh, these tools. Uh, like I said, the implementation of them is going to depend on that platform. So usually, um, even if you're, you know, creating a site that somebody hand wrote um, uh, all the code for, and you're trying to make edits on that, there's still going to be places to put in 
uh, uh, the, the tracking for Google Analytics and Google Search Console. So for Search Console, you don't even need to do a lot of code stuff. You might be able to just edit your DNS and verify it that way. Um, so these tools are going to work no matter what platform uh, you're built on, especially if you're on something like WordPress. Maybe you have a pre-built WordPress theme. That Google SiteKit plugin is going to take care of all the heavy lifting for you. And you're just going to be able to like type in things. Um, it's going to connect everything up for you. Um, uh, Mona asks, we use Flipcause. Is there an SEO tool for it? Um, that I'm not as sure of. Sean, do you happen to know? I don't have experience personally with Flipcloth. Yeah, no. Yeah, so it there there may be things you can do. Um, you know, if you can't find anything, I would say the backstop is making sure that you um, you know, pay attention to the the name of those pages. Um, and uh, I would just browse around. There, they may be called a couple of different things in there because, like I said at the beginning, SEO isn't one thing; it's a suite of other of all these different practices. So it may be in sort of like individual page settings. There may be a separate section for it in Flip Cause itself. Um, here we have another one. Uh, Lisa asks, we had mentioned that uh, mobile was indexed first. Is there something I'm supposed to do to make sure it happens automatically? Nope, that's going to happen whether you like it or not. Um, so it's, it's going to uh, Google uh, just saw that, hey, there's more traffic on, on mobile. You know, we think this is the way that most people are, are consuming this content. That's going to be indexed first. Um, here I'm going to go. There are some in the chat, and so I want to make sure that we get to them as well. Um, Deborah asks, do you have any recommendations for keywords that are virtually unknown? Example, pet trusts. They're not searched for. How can we rank? So one of the things you're going to want to do with this is see how it's being used right now. So going in Search Console or one of those tools like SEM Rush or Moz and seeing, hey, who's showing up for these? How are they talking about them? Um, once you have that information, I would say the, the best, most efficient thing you can do is set up your pages and your websites um, through all the best practices around that term, and then try and generate more traffic um, around it directly to your website. You can't really control what people are and aren't going to search for. And there's not like a way to say, hey, I'm going to push this button. And all of a sudden, you know, my neighbor is going to say, I need to search for X, Y, Z. Um, so really, you want to make sure that you're set up well um, and then try and drive traffic through some of those alternative means, like the flyers or social media or generating backlinks. One of the things you can do is if people don't use the word pet trusts, but they might use something else, you know, try and rank for some of those other keywords that they would use to describe that term. Um, and then, you know, you'll be able to educate them on, hey, this is actually a pet trust. Here's what they are. Here's why it's valuable. Here's why you should be interacting with us. Lily asks, how many pages is ideal for a website? The ideal number of pages is the number of pages it takes to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's if it's a single page website and you can you can get everything that you need on there, maybe it's a very simple organization, don't feel like you need multiple pages. Um, if it's going to take you a lot because you have a lot of blog posts and a lot of resources and things like that, you know, as long as you're not just having pages with like a tiny, tiny bit of information, um, there's not really like a, a maximum on there. Main thing that you're going to be dinged for for like page count is if those pages have more code, um, like the length of the code is longer than the, the content that users actually see. So pay attention to that. See, hey, if we're thinking about this website as a tool, you know, do we need this page to exist or can this content be bundled into... Um, another page, or can we combine this with a couple of different things uh, to have a more helpful tool-oriented page? A lot more coming in here. Um, can you rank for more than one keyword on a page? Yes, you can. Um, so there may be one that you're trying to focus on, but you can have multiple on here. Gary asks, does Google treat .org differently than .com sites? Um, this has been a, a hotly debated question. The answer has changed um, a couple times, at least since I started looking into it a couple of years ago. Um, the answer is not that we know. Um, it's really there are the the TLDs or those different .com, .xyz, things like that. There are certain ones that are blacklisted and are going to hurt you more. Um, but .org or .com uh, is, is really right up there. They're, they're fairly interchangeable. 
Kim asks, some of my pages won't index. It's not clear to me why. Canonical shows up as a reason for some. How can I fix this? Um, so that may just be um, one, Google Search Console will give you a little bit of information on each one. Um, but that will it'll really show you like, hey, it's canonical because this is, you know, a www version of the page is taking priority or something like that. Just canonical, there should be a little bit more information that might be helpful. So there's a couple more questions that we haven't gotten the time. Uh, to answer, I'm sorry, um, but hopefully as you sort of review some of this stuff, um, uh, you'll be able to hopefully answer some of them, or you can reach out to us at this email right here, and, and John and I will be uh, happy to talk to you and, and work through some of these issues. Absolutely. We appreciate everyone coming out today.